Hey guys, it's late in the day and you can see the sun setting over my shoulder. It's still the middle of the winter, but it's not too early to start thinking about planting for this summer and this spring. So you gotta start putting that together, but the first thing that you need to do is figure out if your soil is in good condition. So today we're gonna show you exactly how to do that. Stick around. Now guys, I wanted to talk at least for just a minute about the fact that there are multiple ways to test your soil and then there are multiple ways to amend your soil once you figure out what you are missing. Now on our little homestead, we choose to use organic fertilizer. We try to avoid any type of chemical fertilizers for our little space. We don't have a big homestead, but what we try to do is we try to use anything that can amend the soil to make it better and better and better each year so that it produces more on its own. We're trying to heal the soil that is by default pretty rocky, doesn't have a lot of organic in it and it doesn't grow well. So we're trying to do something that improves that soil versus just treating it topically with fertilizer. Now the second thing is, and that's where we're going to spend most of our time today, is we're going to talk about ways to test your soil. Now the first and easiest way to talk about testing soil is the way that a lot of people suggest. You can actually take a sample of your soil and send it in to a laboratory to be tested. Now that's very easy to do. You can actually just package it up, you send it off, but it takes usually a few, a few weeks to even a month, month and a half to come back and it's pretty costly. You can cost anywhere from $50 to $150 from what we've seen and that's pretty pricey when you talk about it. There's a couple of other limitations as well. First and foremost, depending on how big your garden is, you can have different readings in different areas. So you may find yourself sending multiple samples from different parts of your garden to try to get some average of what you're gonna need across the whole garden. In one area, you may have more clay. In another area, you may have more topsoil. You may have more organics. You may have different things that are needed. So because of that, it's really challenging when you're sending those soil samples off to be done in a way so that you can use it and not just a one one size fits all blanket setting. So for that reason, we don't necessarily recommend it. That. If that's what you wanna do, that's a great way to start. You can absolutely do it. But instead, what we're gonna to talk to you today about is a soil tester that we use. Uh, it's a four-in-one soil tester that we got. So before we made a video to try to show you guys whether we thought these things worked or not, we wanted to prove to ourselves that what we thought we were seeing over the last few years wasn't just an anomaly, wasn't just our imagination, right? Because you can prove a lot of things to yourself when you're not using empirical evidence. So what we wanted to do is put this through a few tests of our own to show you and to show ourselves that they actually worked or they didn't work. Now's a great time to remind you guys, if you like the content from our channel, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel. We would love to hear from you in the comments. One of the best ways that you can help us grow is to share with others on social media that you think might benefit from some of these things as well. All right, let's get back to the video. Now, as I mentioned, this tester is a four-in-one tester. Now, you could probably get by with just a two-in-one tester. And the reason I say that is because two of these options are actually things that you could probably figure out on your own. Now, we liked it because the price point difference between a four-in-one and a two-in-one tester was only a few bucks. But if you're looking to save a few bucks, it might be something that you'd want to drop off. But the two things that are consistent across both of those testers, whether it's a two-in-one, a three-in-one, or four-in-one, they're almost always the two primary and the most important ones are pH and the other is NPK, or what most people will think of as fertility of the soil. Now the other two items are around how much sunlight it's getting, so that light, it'll give you a measurement of light, and it'll also give you a measurement of how dry or how wet the soil is, so a moisture content of the soil as well. Now again, those latter two I think you can probably figure out on your own, but it is nice if you have a tester to kind of see, all right, once I put it down the soil, maybe a few inches down, it might be a little different than what I'm thinking it is at the top of the soil. So it's nice to have the moisture content and also what you think is a lot of light, you can test throughout the day and you can get more of a, an empirical amount of light versus you say, oh, I think this is super sunny. Your plant may not think that. So it's nice to have, I think, a baseline for that as well. Now, if you're starting your seeds out for this year or you're thinking about starting your seeds out, one of the things that you may want to do is you may want to check out our video, and I'll link it above here, on how to set up your own potting soil. We haven't bought potting soil for use in our indoors or for starting seeds in quite some time. And the reason we don't do that is because we like building our own soil from the things that we have available to us. We think it's a much better and we know what goes into it. But if you want to see that video on how to make your own potting soil and or growing soil, check out the link above 
above right here and you can get to a link of that and you can see how we make our own. Now easily the two most important things that these testers will show you are pH and fertility. And the reason is because both of those are things that you wouldn't necessarily be able to really understand until you start seeing your plants fail on you. pH is a big thing for a lot of plants like blueberries, azaleas. Uh, those are acid loving plants and because of that if they don't have the right pH they won't do well. But also the converse is true. Many, many, many plants enjoy either a slightly alkaline or a neutral soil. And if you have soil that the pH is off on, you have an acidic soil, then you're in a spot where those plants won't do well and you're gonna be scratching your head trying to figure out why. That's why these testers are so important. The same is true for nutrients in your soil. If you don't have a good base of fertility in the soil, you also might be watering daily but still see that your plants just don't thrive. Maybe they come up, maybe they're yellow, maybe they're stunted, maybe they don't wanna germinate at all. And a lot of times that's due to fertility in the soil. They'll start to germinate, but then they'll die off quickly. That often has a lot to do with sunlight, has a lot to do with fertility, so it could be a number of things. These testers are great because they'll give you some idea of where to look. So one of the big things that we wanted to do in this video is we wanted to show you some empirical tests, some things that we thought might be good measurements to tell whether these were truly working or not as intended. So one of the easiest to do was pH. We know there are several things out there that we could test against which are known pH levels. They're standard, they're standardized. If you buy things in the store, they should be standardized pHs. And there are some things that are even in nature that we can test against that are known pH levels as well. So we know the acidity level and the pH that it should be. So let's test to see if the tester actually demonstrates that in a semi-controlled space. All right, so when we start our testing, we're gonna go in a very specific order and encourage you to do the same. The reason is because some of these tests need to be wet in order for the test to be accurate. And that's where one of the first things where a lot of people when they say these testers don't work is because they're not testing in a wet environment. So the first thing we're gonna test is we're gonna test the sunlight component. And we're gonna demonstrate whether these things truly measure sunlight accurately or not. Now, accurately is probably a relative term, but we're gonna see if at least when things are brighter or darker, if they truly give you some measurement of that. All right, so the next thing we're gonna to try to test is the light setting. So we're gonna click it over one, the light. See that's lined up with that light setting right there. It's not all the way over to fertility. So we'll be looking at that very uh, that, that next to bottom one, we see the cloud on one side and the sun on the other. That's what we're going to be using. Now here where I'm at right now, it actually is, the sun's kind of moved around. So you can see that it's saying, hey, there's not a lot of light. It's like between two and three from a, uh, a light perspective, right? Ten being super bright, zero being completely dark. It's in that two and a half range. So let's test that theory. I've got some grow lights in here. So let's turn some of the grow lights on. We can see that it shot way up to uh, about six and a half to almost seven. And I'm betting if I move this just a little bit, you can see I actually moved it further out underneath the light and it actually went up some additionally to almost seven. So definitely works now. Let's turn it back off and see if it drops down to the two and a half to three that it was at before. And there you can see, it's actually a little bit lower than it was because it's just a little bit shady over here in this area. So there you go. It definitely works from a light perspective as well. And these are the sensors for the light. So if you ever want to use this, you want to have this aimed towards the sun. Uh, the more you turn it, you know, obviously if I turn it that way, but if I turn it away from the sun, it's going to look darker. The way the needle is probably helping that a little bit, but it does, let's maybe just do this test right here. I'll just put my finger over it. You can see it goes down to virtually, I can't quite cover it up all the way, but it's almost zero. But when I take my finger back off, it shoots back up to two. If I turn it this way some towards the sun, it goes back closer to three. So it does actually work for the light test. Now the second thing we're gonna test for is the moisture content. And again, we wanna test this before we add any water to it because we wanna be able to demonstrate whether the soil is truly wet or not, right? So the moisture content is something you wanna test up front, and we can see whether this is showing moist, dry, or somewhere in between. You can see that we're gonna switch this over to moisture. See right down here as moisture, so we're gonna switch this over. 
see that this is set on moisture, right? So we want to use this section right up here, the, the one that's right down from the top. So that's the second one here. And then we'll also want to clean our probes with our Brillo pad. Now, we'll go ahead and stick our probe into the ground here. You can see that it actually settled in there on the dry setting, which is actually consistent because if you look here, this stuff's really dry. So this stuff is, is I haven't watered this in, in several days, so it's actually very, very dry. Let's see what happens when we add some water. Now you can see that we added water in there and it went up into the middle. Now it's dissipating quickly, right? So we only sprayed it right around where the probe was, but you can see that the water as it's kind of moving down into the soil, it's, you know, it's drying back out as the moisture goes away from it and, and seeps into other parts of the soil that are still dry around it. You can actually see that that's moving down steadily into the dry area again, still north of where it was before, but it's still showing this as dry ground. So this shows you that when we put the water on there, like we did, it immediately shot up because we were spraying water directly on it. But when we took the water away and the, the soil has an opportunity to now allow that water to seep out to its normal level, you can see here that it's actually accurately showing that it's still dry, even around that area. Now the pH test is next, and that is the most important test because that's the one I think most people look for in these testers. Now I do wanna make sure you understand the soil needs to be very moist. I would even use the term wet. These probes work on conductivity and they have different types of metal that each one is made out of. And so it's testing a relative conductivity between those through a moist soil. So that soil has to be pretty wet. If you use dry soil, it's not going to work and you're going to come back and say, oh, my tester didn't work. That's not necessarily a fair estimate. Even says in directions that your soil must be wet in order for that to work. So we're going to try our pH test first. So when we do our test, we're going to do a test against a liquid vinegar, which is white vinegar, which we know the pH for. And then we're also going to do a test against coffee that has been saturated with water. And then now this is now I want to make sure you know that this is brewed coffee. This is not fresh coffee that hasn't been brewed yet because we know the baseline for brewed coffee and what the pH of that should be. So we're going to actually move this over to all the way to the right where it says pH. Flip it over there and we're going to be using this top section up here, which you can see currently it's set to seven. Let's see how our pH stacks up. It's just a hair under seven, uh, and we can sit here and let this sit for a while. Actually, I'll, I'll pause this and we'll come back to it in a few minutes and we'll check it out and see how it looks. Okay, you can see that after a little while here, it has moved down just ever so slightly. It's still sitting at just under seven, which means this is very close to neutral pH, just a hair on the acidic level. Uh, but, you know, again, I would consider this neutral um, until it gets down to the 5-4 range. But I'm just saying it's just slightly under 7 by this. Now, I'm going to show you now, just in case you were wondering, hey, does this thing actually work? What if it just says 7 for everything? I'm going to now move over and I'm going to show you what uh, both coffee grounds and what white vinegar looks like as well. And you can see how those stack up at known pH levels. Okay, we've got our tester set up. Its baseline setting is at 7, so that's really what it sits at all the time. It's set to pH, which is what we need it. We're using distilled water because for the test we wanted to make sure we weren't adding any pH to the water, so that should be neutral. Now we're going to go ahead and start trying our test here. We have a jar full of spent coffee, and I want to make sure you understand this is spent coffee. 
whatever you get from say uh, Starbucks or anything like that, that's what you're using here. So we know the pH of spent coffee, which is important. Now, as we're putting in our tester here, you can see that it's actually sitting now at a little below six as we first put it in. Now, if we let it sit for a little while, you can see that it gets even lower here in this picture. It's dropped from six to about five and a half. So it's important that you make sure that if you're doing your own test, you leave it in for about 10 to 15 minutes. Now that we've seen that our coffee test actually proved out, we're gonna move on to vinegar. Now this is a standard vinegar. It's distilled white vinegar that you can buy in any store. You can see here, this is specifically reduced to 4%. So that's how we know the acidity level that it's supposed to be. So now we've got it submersed and you can see that this is dramatically lower. The peach is sitting at just a little under two which is exactly where it should be for distilled white vinegar. So this is demonstrating to us that the pH is not only directionally correct, but it's also accurate. Now, finally, we're gonna test fertility. Now, one caveat, this fertility test only gives you the high level fertility. It does not break down the NPK values across all three things. Now, I for one don't think that's a deal breaker. And the reason I say that is because I think most NPKs are tied together, especially if you're doing organic fertilizer like we are. So in a lot of ways, when we add things like rabbit manure or compost, it's going to be a fairly balanced component that we're adding to it. And then it's gonna break down. The plants are gonna use what they want out of it and they're gonna process it on their own. So we're just looking for baseline NPK. Now that I've got that out of the way, we'll go ahead and see how it works. The next thing we're gonna test here is the fertility level. So what we're gonna need to do is move this over, switch it over by one. So it's all the way to the left to the fertility and you can see that right now it's registering zero on the fertility scale. So remember the first thing we said we need to do is we need to make sure that the soil is wet in order for this to work. So let's get this to a consistency of a kind of a mud. Got this switched over to fertility. Let's try this out. Now, we just put this in the ground or into the soil and it's coming under just under the ideal level. So it's in the too little space. This doesn't surprise me, however, we just finished growing. So it's pulled a lot of nutrients out of this by growing all winter long. And obviously we haven't added anything back into this from a uh, a soil perspective from any type of amendments from our rabbits or using any of that potting soil. So let's try a different median. Okay, so we add a little bit of water and this is actually a cup that we have for some of our newer seeds here. And you can actually see that this is now moved up into the ideal space. It's a little towards the bottom. Uh, so not sure exactly how accurate this is, but we can definitely see that it moved. Now this also may be pushing this based off of using non-organic fertilizers too, right? So we only use organic fertilizers here. So this may be set up to read something that's more around the chemical fertilizers, but even with this, this is actually showing that we're in an ideal spot. So now that we finished our testing, I think we can all agree that these do a pretty good job of testing for the basics of what they're intended for. They actually do show a difference between pH, which I think is the most important thing and the one we use it for the most. The fertility works as well. And then additionally, we think that the light and the moisture meter both are sensitive enough to tell you good information, especially if you're trying to calibrate your own personal baseline and eyeball things and then get a feel for it later on. So these are things I think that give you a good baseline and they do work. Now we did not test any other testers. So full disclosure there, I can't tell you whether there are any other brands would work or not but when we put this one through its paces this one actually did work now if you're interested in this specific tester i've got a link in the description below that you can click on that'll take you to it that's the one that we put through the paces it's about 13 dollars or so and that's you know at the time we made this video that's what it was going for but with inflation i don't know how much it'll be when you click on it but you can check it out and you can see how much it is i will say though one of the cool things about this is that you never have to replace a battery it doesn't use batteries in it and so that's a pretty neat feature of these that you'll never have to worry about uh, replacing batteries in a digital environment things like that that's always a bummer when you go out there to do something and you need a battery but these don't require batteries uh, so that's a pretty cool feature 
Thanks so much for hanging out with us today, guys. We've enjoyed making this video. We hope you learned a little something along the way. And if you have some insights or you think there was something that we missed in the test, drop it in the comments below. We'd love to hear maybe if we missed something or if we did something wrong that you think, hey, we've probably got some science teachers out there who say, oh, you know, hey, here's a better way that you could do it. We'd love to hear about that because we'd love to do the test again and maybe ensure that we did it the right way. Also, guys, if you like the video, please, if you want to help our channel out, hit that subscribe button, pound the like button. That really tells the YouTube algorithm that this is something that people should watch and that will help us out tremendously. Otherwise, God bless you guys and we'll see you next time on the Purpose Driven Homestead. So before we made this video, you can hear the geese in the background. So you guys can hear the, back, the geese flying over as I speak right now. <laughs> what are you guys still doing here? I've got work to do. I bet you do too. We'll see you next time.